Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So before Elizabeth starts and before everyone settles in, I would just like to uh, welcome you all to the session. Uh, the session on incorporating responsible sourcing in retail supply chains is being organized by WWF India with support from the Center for Responsible Business at the Retail Associations of, of India's uh, Retail Leadership Summit. We would like to welcome you all to the session. Uh, so I have my colleague, Ms. Vidya Sandarajan with me. Uh, she is the Director of Ecological Footprints at WWF India and has over 20 years of experience in sustainability, climate change and related roles. I would like to hand over the stage to her to introduce Elizabeth and uh, initiate the session. Thank you. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'll start from here only. Um, May I? So I just wanted to basically um, highlight a few points. You can see that uh, WWF India is a gold partner to the retail summit. You might, many of you, and I'm assuming all of you are Hello, thinking, Jake. what does WWF India have got to do in a re retail summit? Thank you. In a retail summit. Um, so. The reason that we are here, and the reason that you will see a lot many more like us joining all of you, uh, representing the nature and your primary supply um, is going to happen very much, very soon. So that's why we are here. I would really like to um, request all of you um, to give us a little bit of attention. So um, the panel is also going to be slightly different. And I understand that for the last couple of days, you've been talking about digitization and you've been talking about um, conversations around how can we uh, be more tech savvy. Um, I would like to say as, um, as a conservation person, um, we have CEOs on the panel and we had actively requested them to come virtual. Uh, because we are all wanting to save our carbon footprint. We want it to be extremely efficient. And they are representing companies which are making massive changes to their footprint and efficiency, but also a very responsible sourcing. So you heard about, you know, uh, feeding into customers' desires, where there is a huge demand retailers want to go. Uh, we would also like retailers to start looking at how do we look at responsibly sourcing the primary natural materials that come into a supply chain and thereby influence the entire consumption in a positive manner. And I'm sure by now all of you are aware that climate change is a huge issue and so our natural resources are depleting. And any amount of planning on grand retail um, is not going to thrive as long as there isn't backhand planning on the natural supply system. So with that note, I'm going to request uh, my colleague from WWF International, Liz um, Elizabeth Clark. She's the director and, um, at WWF Singapore. And WWF Singapore, as well as um, many of our uh, other organizations have been working very closely with Indonesia, Malaysia, Sumatra, several other countries where uh, there were rich evergreen rainforests and now oil palm is being cultivated. And I'm sure all of you know palm oil is a huge component in many of your supply chains. So this is more about understanding how do we source responsibly. And I'm sure now given the context that Indonesia has banned exports of palm oil, and uh, India had depended quite a bit on it, and many of your core palm oil was coming from there. 
um, let's delve and find out what's the what's the root cause, what's the reason, and how can we influence that? Liz, over to you. She is um, um, she's our, she's been working as conservation director and leading our palm oil work. There is an international coalition on uh, palm oil and um, uh, WWF with several other organizations such as RSPO uh, and Rainforest Alliance and others have been working with large uh, procurers, retailers uh, towards the direction. She'll talk to you all about what is responsible sourcing. Um, and also as a, as a woman, I wanted to say that we, we wanted to have it as an all women panel. So it's me, Liz and um, my colleague Karishma talking to all of you. Liz, over to you. Well, thank you very much. And I, I hope you can hear me, but do message me on the Zoom function if there's any problem with the sound. Um, welcome to all of you and to the esteemed speakers and panelists at this event. I'm very honored to be invited to introduce this session from Singapore. And I will start actually by showing a video and hope that the sound uh, works for you in the room. But if not, you can always just Watch the images, thank you. Right, I, I was believing really sharing a video because I think it, it, it speaks louder than, than words uh, to show that imagery. So I hope that video demonstrates just how much we know the importance of, of nature, um, but we consistently undervalue its importance. So for example, 25% of the global population rely on forests for their subsistence needs, for livelihoods, for employment and for income. We are all dependent on nature for health and well-being, and this interdependency between humans and nature and our reliance on nature is most keenly and directly felt by the world's most vulnerable and poor for subsistence and for livelihoods. And the economy is heavily reliant on nature, particularly for construction, for agriculture, and for the food and beverage sectors. In 2020, the World Economic Forum said that in excess of 50% of global GDP is either moderately or heavily dependent on biodiversity and nature. The economic benefits are estimated to be in the range of some 125 trillion US dollars every year. And all of the sustainable development goals are dependent on nature. But as you saw in that video, nature is in crisis. Our use of nature has exceeded Earth's biocapacity. The cumulative exploitation of nature for fishing, for forestry, for grazing, for cropland, and the associated footprint with this for carbon uh, contributes to a global footprint of some 1.5 Earths per year. So clearly this cannot be sustained and we are already suffering the consequences of over-exploitation of nature. So for example, on average, 13 million hectares of forest disappears every year, often with devastating impacts on communities and indigenous peoples, on biodiversity and climate change, making deforestation one of the most significant global environmental challenges that we face today. In addition to impacts on well-being and livelihoods, the nature loss crisis deepens the climate change crisis. Nature is essential for carbon storage and sequestration, 
and also for climate regulation. It's also essential for climate adaptation. For example, it provides us with nature-based solutions for flood control, for coastal defense, for soil erosion control, and for wildfire control, amongst many other services. It also impacts upon the economy. The World Economic Forum earlier this year ranked climate change related risks in the top three and environmental related risks in half of the top 10 global risks by severity. So these risks include climate action failure, extreme weather and biodiversity loss. And we've seen over the years of these reports from the World Economic Forum that slowly but surely environmental risks are topping the list and creeping in more and more into that top 10. So we cannot ignore it. It's an absolute imperative. So what is causing and driving this loss in nature? Well, the top driver of nature loss is change in land and sea use. And this is primarily uh, as a result of habitat loss and habitat degradation. And food systems are the number one threat to nature, uh, causing that change that we're seeing in both land and sea use. The increasing and expanding agriculture of various forest linked commodities, such as soybean, palm oil, timber, pulp and paper, and natural rubber, are further aggravating deforestation, as well as various other environmental issues. Nature's recovery depends on business transformation. So at WWF, we talk about bending the curve of biodiversity and nature loss. So this loss that we've seen over the last 50 years, as demonstrated in that earlier video, what we're working towards is nature positivity. We can do this by turning away from business as usual um, and towards increasing our conservation efforts and increasing sustainable production and consumption efforts and the retail sector can demand and drive this action. So what can businesses do? So very simply, businesses can commit, they can act, and they can advocate for nature positivity. There's a need to mitigate or minimize deforestation by adopting responsible sourcing and procurement practices in order to ensure sustainable supply chains. Consistent action amongst stakeholders can also help move upstream and downstream players towards ethical and sustainable supply chains. This can be through practices such as joining regional and multi-stakeholder platforms, by setting time-bound commitments, by disclosing commitments to promote transparency within the sector, and by adopting voluntary certification and standards such as the RSPO and the FSC. These could also have far-reaching positive impacts on forests the environment and nature. The current pandemic has affected global supply chains, so it then becomes an imperative to integrate sustainability practices and to adopt responsible sourcing commitments. And to advocate, encourage and insist on others doing the same and taking on shared responsibility. Now, given the key role of the food sector, WWF advocates for a food systems approach. Firstly, this includes nature positive production methods. So no new habitat conversion and sustainable management of agriculture areas and wider landscapes. Secondly, the elimination of food loss and waste from the farm to the fork. And thirdly, sustainable consumption aligning human and environmental health so that everyone has healthy and nutritious diets within planetary boundaries. With increased awareness on sustainability and the available choices, consumers are becoming more and more conscious about the environmental and social impacts caused by their consumption patterns. Retailers are the intermediaries between manufacturers and consumers, and their role in promoting responsible sourcing becomes even more critical. Conversely, inaction by retailers is a source of serious brand reputation risk, amongst other risks, such as supply chain security and compliance with increasing regulatory requirements for responsible sourcing. 
So this panel discussion, incorporating responsible sourcing in retail supply chains, organized with the support of the Center for Responsible Business at the Retail Leadership Summit, is aiming to focus on how retailers and businesses could eliminate environmental risks, such as deforestation, in their supply chains by adopting resource responsible sourcing practices for forest-linked commodities. So with that, I do wish you uh, a very good discussion, and I thank you very much for inviting me here to open proceedings. Thank you very much, uh, Liz. Um, so we would now hear a small um, recording which Mr. Jamshed Godrej made this morning. Uh, he was due to come here, but he's um, unfortunately in another responsible sourcing meeting. Um, so Godrej and Boys as, a, uh, as an entity have really been uh, conscious and have been supportive of the whole process. Um, and so we would really, and we were very keen that um, a leader in this sector uh, saying a few words would potentially uh, mean a lot more to all of you than us championing for environment. So over to Mr. Godrej, please. Good afternoon. I am Jamshid Godrej. Chairman and Managing Director of Godrej & Boyce Manufacturing Company Limited and a former President of WWF India. The latest IPCC report 2022 on climate change impacts, adaptation and vulnerability underlines that climate change is already impacting every corner of the world and much more severe impacts are in store if we fail to halve greenhouse gas emissions this decade. The next few years offer a narrow window to realize a sustainable, livable future for all. Changing course will require immediate, ambitious and concerted efforts to slash emissions, build resilience, conserve ecosystems and dramatically increase finance for adaptation and address loss and damage. The private sector has been and can play a leading role in this transformation. At the COP26 summit in Glasgow in November 2021, 12 leading global agri MNCs made commitments to pursue net zero emissions globally by 2050, halt biodiversity loss and provide sustainable livelihoods along their value chain. 21 leading MNCs with their collective market value of more than US dollars 1.8 trillion are part of a coalition called Forest Positive, hosted by the Consumer Goods Forum. These companies have been leveraging collective action and accelerate systemic efforts to remove deforestation, forest degradation and conservation from key commodity supply chains. A number of companies that are part of both these initiatives are present in India, and perhaps some even in this room. Growing demand for agri-forest linked commodities prompts greater attention in sourcing practices by the private sector. Sourcing practices are increasingly being calibrated to prevent the mitigation adverse impacts on soil. Land use, water, ecosystems, communities, etc. COVID-19 is a stark reminder of how fragile these interconnections are between business and the resources that they are dependent on. So there is an urgent need to rethink business models, processes and systems to strengthen this interconnection. India Incorporated has already taken steps in this direction. RAI brings together business leaders across the industry, including the food and FMCG industry. Through this platform, we would like to make this clarion call for India Incorporated, especially the leaders in the food and FMCG segment, to embrace 
and drive positive actions in their supply chain, such as such that adverse impacts on forest and forest resources are kept within limits. Thank you guys for listening in peacefully. Um, and uh, so this is our panel. Now, thankfully, they can see me as well. Um, uh, so um, I will introduce the panelists, but I'm sure many of you already know. And a warm welcome to all of you, um, Aloka, Sanjeev, um, Dheeraj, and Liz. Um, thank you very much for joining us here. I will um, very quickly um, and uh, set the context for the conversation. Um, and, and many of them here on the panel, as you are aware, have been championing responsible sourcing or at least uh, building the capacity of the retail sector as well as the financial sector um, in garnering a better understanding and moving forward with the climate impacts having adverse effects on the entire supply chain, on our entire value chain, on the availability of resources. Um, how do we internalize that and what are the core challenges and what are the opportunities in that spectrum for us to be able to meet those challenges moving forward? Um, and as you are aware, which I shouldn't be the one saying this, um, you know, retail as a sector is highly vulnerable to even smaller shocks. And so is the other end of the spectrum, which is nature. While, you know, your natural resource might be very resilient and we might continue to get, uh, you know, resources for millions of years, as you have seen, but it's also extremely vulnerable to shocks. And so how do we secure the two ends of the spectrum? And that is where this whole conversation comes together. So before uh, taking any more time, I'll quickly introduce um, so we've um, already met um, Elizabeth Clark. She's the Conservation Director of WLF Singapore. And globally, she leads the responsible sourcing work primarily around uh, palm oil. And in the past, she has led several um, very important roles in um, including banks in RSPO and um, other platforms. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Sanjeev Astana, who is the CEO of Ruchi Soya. And I suppose uh, many of you already um, know him as well. Um, we also have um, Ms. Mrs. Aloka Majumdar. Um, she is the uh, head of corporate sustainability at HSBC India. Um, and I'm very glad to say that HSBC um, as an institution has been on this journey of uh, mitigating and adapting to climate change for uh, well over a decade now. Uh, and specifically looking at responsible sourcing from the point of view of palm oil and the impact that it has on the natural wealth. HSBC has been a huge um, supporter and, and also a champion of the cause. So Aloka, welcome to this. Um, and uh, we have um, Mr. Dheeraj Talreja, who is president of AAK, and they are um, also one of the organizations who has uh, really taken up uh, you know, the responsible sourcing have signed up to RSPO and are uh, keenly looking to transform their businesses in a way that the impact on the environment is um, positive and, and not negative. So with that, I would, um, thank you very much. I would like to start with um, uh, Sanjeev um, first. Um, I just want you to share some experience uh, you know, of how companies have uh, adopted active sustainable sourcing policies, um, just keeping in, you know, sort of agri forest commodity perspective, if you can share a little bit, Sanjeev, thanks. Uh, thank you, Vidya, and uh, extremely uh, relevant uh, sort of uh, topic for discussion today. Uh, so, Ruchi Soya from, uh, you know, the businesses that we do, and uh, we are very major sort of importers of uh, edible oils in the country. And uh, one of the edible oils, uh, you know, which is always in the news for uh, all the wrong reasons, I would say many a times, is the palm oil sourcing. And, uh, you know, from that perspective, in terms of the amount of, uh, you know, uh, you know, this whole issue around deforestation of land, 
uh, especially the carbon lands in uh, Indonesia, you know, this whole activism and the whole that has gone on uh, clearly has been a source of, uh, uh, you know, major uh, uh, sort of a challenge and, uh, and uh, for the right reasons as well. Uh, so over a period of time, uh, you know, we started uh, sort of adopting uh, different practices. And I must confess that if you go back a decade, uh, this was not, uh, you know, part of the thought process also. But gradually, Ruchi took membership of RSPO. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, major compliance standards uh, set in from the kind of suppliers we buy from. Uh, we ourselves, uh, you know, did, which is also in the big news right now, uh, in terms of the, our own oil palm plantations, uh, you know, which are largely right now in the south of India. And uh, now under the new policy, uh, you know, we are taking up major plantations in the northeastern belt of the country. And one of the key issues which keeps coming up is that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the key issues which keeps coming up is the uh, issue related to, uh, you know, the challenge around that is it going to cause deforestation in the ecologically sensitive belt of northeast. And I want to assure everyone that, you know, one of the conscious choices that we made was that this is not, uh, you know, there's no deforestation. We are not cutting any forest to plant uh, oil palm. These are either lands uh, which are moving away from the existing agriculture land. Uh, so, you know, for example, paddy in uh, Andhra and Telangana and Karnataka, in the case of Northeast, these are lands which are either unfarmed or they're being farmed with something else, which we are planning to do. So we've made uh, you know, conscious choices from right from beginning in terms of both the compliances of what we do, uh, the kind of sourcing that we, uh, that we uh, handle ourselves and the kind of manufacturing or production of oil palm that we're taking up. And this not just uh, is in palm oil, it cuts across the company's, uh, uh, company's perspectives. And I may talk later if I get a chance on the, you know, this entire issue around the ESG and BS, BRSR report that uh, the SEBI is insisting on. So as a large uh, listed firm, the compliances and et cetera that we need to do for the investor perspective, but that perhaps uh, later in the, in the talk. Thank you very much. Um, just leading on, you know, from what you were saying, I might quickly want to jump to um, Mr. Dheeraj and ask him if he can share experiences specifically um, you know, from a perspective of companies that have to engage with the wider group of stakeholders, uh, you know, buyers, investors, consumers, um, where does the thought process of responsible sourcing stand? And what are the key sort of objectives um, when you undertake a journey such as that? Uh, thanks, Vidya, for having me on this platform. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, slightly, okay. my, yeah. Is it better now? Yes. Okay. So I think uh, firstly, as you ask the question that, you know, across the value chain, I feel that uh, ESG or sustainability journey at a different stage, if you really see across the value chain and uh, how we are uh, playing a role actually. So AAK uh, is, a, is, a, is a 150 year old company based out of Sweden. And we have been in the journey of making better happen. And making better happen, not the best happen, but the better, because better has uh, no limitation, actually. You can always walk into, into today and say that, okay, how can I make today's sourcing better than yesterday's sourcing? How can I make uh, my product better today than what, what I did yesterday with that? So with the same, uh, with the same uh, purpose, actually, what we are trying to support the, the different players in the value chain is about, uh, uh, about sourcing of sustainable uh, raw materials. Uh, whether it is palm, whether it is uh, soya, whether it is coconut, whether it is any other any other raw materials across with that. Coming specific to your question, I mean, uh, uh, where do the where do the different players in the value chain stand? Uh, they are at a different levels actually. So retailers are at a different level. Some uh, some of the retailers are are uh, driving their uh, global mandate. Some of the retailers are driving regional mandate. Some are driving the the local mandate with that. So that's at a different stages. Uh, people people are there if we segment the the industry across with that. I mean, uh, um, our our uh, engagement and our uh, interaction with them is to support them that how to create a sustainable journey. So helping them to define a purpose. I mean, why are we in purpose? What is the purpose of being in business? I mean, yes, I mean, you you find different responses to that, but that's something is a starting point for a conversation. And post that, you know, supporting them 
onto the the defining that this is a way that you can achieve the sustainability maybe it's it's a long journey it's not that overnight that you can say i'm i'm, I'm ready to switch uh, uh, my my sustainable sourcing from day 1 to the next day to 100% of it because you need to you need to adapt your um, business processes you need to adapt uh, your business process related to uh, sourcing of raw material you need to adapt your business process related to manufacturing you need to adapt your business processes in terms of communicating to consumers actually because you need to have you need to have a better awareness with the consumers because the consumers are demanding for sustainable products and that's where i think i think the entire change uh, change uh, uh, positive change is going to move actually i mean so that's in in short actually with the uh, what uh, uh, what we are doing and engaging with different players in the value chain and uh, i mean just it's a it's a coincidence that we released our sustainability report yesterday you know and uh, and we are also trying to help them how to define the kpis actually so you know besides sustainable sourcing how you can define that okay you know uh, traceability to plantation traceability to mill and all those different parameters which are which are helpful because you know because you know something that we are in ahead of the curve and maybe maybe we can support other guys who want to jump onto this journey as sanjeev also mentioned that you know I mean that's where something like you know ESG, which is which is getting talked a lot actually. I mean, BSC has come out for the long, uh, large listed companies about the sustainability journey, and that's where companies like us we we can we can collaborate and support the other players to to walk the walk the talk. Thank you very much, Deeraj. Um, that takes me very quickly to Aloka, but just before that, Aloka, um, Liz, thank you very much. I understand you have a very important meeting to go to. Thank you very much for setting the context and, um, you know, internationally holding the baton in this cause. Thanks. Thank um, you very much. Thank you. So, Aloka, um, you know, we, we've heard two different perspectives, um, you know, at two different levels in terms of what are the challenges um, and the diversity of stakeholders. I was wondering, uh, you know, if you could share your views on, um, you know, what is the support mechanism required for uh, entities to incorporate their, uh, you know, responsible sourcing um, in their retail supply chains? And, um, and, and, you know, I'm sure you are looking at it from a different perspective and you might also have a view on what are the challenges that remain. So if you can just touch upon those two. Um, I think we would finish the full circle on challenges and then we will move to opportunities. Sure. Uh, so thank you so much, Vidya. And uh, I think um, uh, we've already heard the other panelists who have actually uh, you know, highlighted some very important things. It's a pretty complex area. I mean, we've started working on uh, you know, supply chains. Uh, it has been, our experience has been that it's pretty complex. Uh, and But I'll just try and, uh, you know, highlight two things and some of the work we've done, done in terms of you know how to address these challenges. Uh, the first, of course, is assessing and addressing climate risks. I think that's when, when we're talking to our clients and customers, this is the first thing that we are saying. So you're assessing and addressing. Uh, you know, climate uh, changes in climate is impacting the supply chain in a variety of ways. And uh, while on the one hand, it affects the production of raw material, uh, impacting the quantity and quality of the produce, uh, on the other hand, it can affect the people and communities associated across, uh, you know, various uh, processes and functions. Uh, further, these climate risks can impact sustainability targets on water and energy, among others. Uh, prolonged impacts can widen the supply demand gap, impacting businesses on a large scale. Uh, so that's that's one thing I wanted to highlight. The second piece uh, will be that of changing consumer demand and es establishing traceability. I think this is something you know, just the earlier panelists spoke about. I think, you know, with advancements in communication, uh, consumers worldwide have started demanding uh, information on origin of products, uh, condition of growers and workers, uh, status and use of inputs, among others. Now, this has initiated the discourse and action on traceability of products. Um, and then with your, we've done a lot of work with uh, you and WWF, as you're aware. And our experience says that establishing a robust and accurate system of traceability is very complex. Uh, but, but of course, uh, surely there have been some efforts in this direction. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a pretty complex procedure is what we've seen. Uh, in terms of addressing these risks, um, our experience has taught us that there is a local manifestation of climate risks, uh, which needs to be assessed uh, through data science. Uh, Long-term analysis of you know, historical and uh, future climate data, I think, is a very, very important part. 
uh, and integration of vulnerability assessments is also something that I wanted to highlight, which gives us an indication as to how the risks are manifesting and what are the impacts. Uh, I wanted to mention that you know different groups of people or different types of services may experience vulnerability in a very different manner. Uh, but it becomes easier to understand and record these uh, different, uh, you know, differential vulnerabilities. So that's uh, another thing I wanted to highlight. I just, before I close, I just wanted to, you know, um, take one example of, and that of cotton. Uh, because, you know, we've, um, uh, we're working very closely with uh, WWF and Q with them on this. And uh, uh, the recently released a study on, as part of a project, we recently released a study on mapping climate risks and vulnerability of cotton growing regions of Maharashtra. And, uh, and this is almost a first of its kind study to develop a state level vulnerability index for cotton crop. Now, on climate, we would need a more granular system of recording climate data uh, to better inform our decision making. Uh, we have tested the application of digital tools to record granular climate data in our interventions with cotton farmers in Maharashtra. Uh, and, and again, we have tried to use blockchain uh, for, for uh, you know, uh, putting together a traceability tool. So I, I would also like to focus on the fact that there will be a fair amount of use of technology uh, when while addressing this issue. So even when you're talking about addressing uh, the, with the uh, you know, sustainability in supply chains, there's going to be a huge demand for technology to do so because it's, it's a pretty complex procedure. So I think it will, investment in technology is also going to be a pretty significant task uh, while addressing you know, the challenges. So I'll hand over to you Vidya with uh, these comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aloka. Um, so uh, quickly, another one. I mean, uh, you know, you've already spoken about a few things that HSBC as a financial institution has done. Is there, um, is there a larger role that the financial sector as a whole can uh, play in uh, promoting responsible sourcing? Uh, do you see that happening in the near time, um, in the next five to 10 years time frame? Yeah. I think with their going forward, that's going to be a very, very significant part of, uh, of any financial institution's uh, role in the sector, because uh, I think as a financial institution, the most significant impact we can have uh, is helping our clients to transition to producing lower carbon emissions through financing and investment. So, and a large part of this is actually going to be driven by the supply chain. So therefore that's, it is going to be a critical, uh, you can say, uh, both in terms of a critical focus as well as a critical opportunity as well. I think at HSBC, we see this as a major opportunity. Um, you know, being, being a global bank, uh, the of what we've seen is that our reach and global clients would mean that we can influence uh, and you know, shape fundamental change in this as well. Uh, the other thing I wanted to highlight is the fact that, you know, as a bank, we have made some very specific uh, commitments in 2020, where we've said, you know, we will become a net zero organization. Now, how does a bank become a net zero organization? It will be twofold. One is, of course, through our own operations. And our own operations, of course, will have a huge supply chain piece. But the other is finance divisions. So which would mean that we work with our clients in that entire transition journey. And that's something which is going to be the main thing. And we know that it's going to require a huge amount of investments. You know, uh, uh, different institutions, Stanford and others have come up with figures which are, you know, into trillions of dollars that will be required in terms of the, the transition. The other piece I think with the list spoke about is that of sustainability risks. And I also spoke about, you know, the big challenge in terms of assessing sustainability risks. And this is something I think the financial institutions will play a very important role in this as well. Uh, because how you assess risk will uh, kind of help you uh, both in terms of uh, for, for the organization which is financing, for us it will be critical that we are able to assess risks to, for us to make that kind of investment. I think that's going to be a very, very important uh, part of the work that we'll do. Uh, and the last piece I wanted to focus on, you know, as a financial institution, it's just not for financial institutions alone, but I think the, the, the nature of the beast that we're talking about or the nature of the problem that we're talking about there will need to be a lot of collaboration and collective action if you are to make this work. And um, I would say, you know, enhancing awareness, upskilling, mindset change, 
these will play a very important role and i think clients and financial institutions will have to work together on this uh, journey and uh, and and also when when any organization is working in that transition as a financial institution we want to also consider the social aspect of this transition uh, so that it's just an inclusive because you know when you are making changes in the supply chain it just can't be that i'm looking at one particular factor it has to be a very very uh, and in the the aim will be to make it a just an inclusive transition and uh, so that you know we can help the clients and customers and the wider community in their transition so that's something that i'll end with uh, with you thank you very much aloka um i i okay we have little time but i'll like to open it up but before that um one question each to sanjeev and dheeraj sanjeev um, going to you first uh, you know from a um, from a sort of a producer manufacturer processing perspective um and and this is a retailers conference and where we are talking about sustainable sourcing to me retail is a window which is where the actual scale up uh, where the actual transformation happens um but how do we incentivize that process or you know um how do we encourage more and more retailers to start looking at responsible sourcing uh so with the the answer i mean having worked in a retail company before so uh, you know clearly retailers as a as a as a commercial enterprise are constantly looking at servicing the demands of the consumers so i would say there are two ways to do that one is what exactly all of us are collectively doing now that uh, build up uh, strong advocacy uh you know the narrative has to be built in very well the consumer awareness uh, has to be brought about so the consumers are enforcing a change which we are already witnessing in a very significant way in uh, europe and north america and uh, that is driving a big part of the change that the consumers are you know picking up produce and there are dedicated retail chains which are uh, now working on uh, you know the uh, the sourcing what they do of responsible uh, sort of sourcing and what they sell from the retail shops the second part is that uh, you know to the point what aloka said and that dheeraj also alluded that to that earlier and i think as a large corporates have a responsibility for this to cascade down and to that extent uh, the responsibility of the large businesses to ensure that uh, not only are they practicing it uh, you know within the company but also making sure that this uh, message goes out loud and clear to the entire supply chain stakeholders they have uh in terms of how they source you know the kind of uh, you know the transportation and logistics uh, which is built in uh, the supply chains that evolve and how finally it is reaching the uh, reaching the retail point i think they have a significant role to play and of course institutions like wwf what you are doing or rai in terms of building up an advocacy and i think it's a process i think it's a work in progress that will built in india was earlier not on that uh, path but now increasingly the and i just want to take a 30 seconds on how the compliance requirements and the regulations are going to make it very important so this whole environment sustainability and governance standards set by sebi and uh, insistence on you know the mandatory filing of prsr report every year i think that is going to start uh, you know pulling in a lot of uh, lot of uh, you know energy into the whole process and i think that to accelerating the process of responsible working of corporates i think will become better uh, so i leave it at that and uh, happy to answer any questions thank you sanjeev but um, before we open um, to dheeraj um, so i spoke about incentives of course sanjeev did touch about compliance and mandatory regulations i also wanted to know what role does you know punitive measure play in this i mean is there a role at all is that how the um, is does that in any way influence the retail sector the other half of the question this is more from a Uh, from me posing it as a consumer to say the retails do have a huge power in terms of influencing the consumers buying we all know that from placement to design to you know highlighting key factors there is there is a lot of um succinct psychological influence that happens so is there is there a role how do we incentivize that process um with the retailers to start thinking about um uh, you know in a way uh, influencing a greater uptake of responsibly sourced products um dheeraj to you sorry okay. uh so vidya you know 
I think uh, if, you're, if the question, if, if I see that you ask a couple of uh, aspects of it on our punitive measures, punitive measures, and also around uh, how can uh, retailers play a role in placement and, and all those things. See, uh, the business case is simple. If, if you really do a consumer survey across uh, in India, uh, I believe, uh, and, and there are reports available, that one in two consumer would prefer to buy sustainable products. The complexity comes that you know sustainability has a different connotation and different meaning to different different people in the society with that. And when whenever a deeper work was being done, we found at least at least the work that we done we found that you know social basics, which is which uh, uh, Aloka also mentioned, Sanjeev also mentioned that human rights, gender rights, equitable society, combined with eco conservation, which we call it as green, actually is equal to sustainability from Indian perspective, Indian consumer perspective. So that's that's one way to look at it, and you know just to endorse what I'm saying, I went to the retailers which which work on a which are a commercial enterprises work on a thin margins with a lot of volatility. Cross with that, what we did was that uh, since I was as Loka mentioned, we work very closely with WWF also. What we did was that we did a consumer survey. We did a consumer survey uh, along with WWF in uh, different parts of India. And we didn't go for the top uh, supermarkets and all those things. We decided to do the survey at the small bakeries, small food outlets, and, and different places across uh, over there. And we we demonstrated, okay, I mean, uh, uh, so, you know, uh, if given a choice that you are offered a pack of uh, biscuit or a pack of uh, chocolate or a pack of XYZ product, and and there are there are cost impacts which are two pesa, three pesa, or one pesa less than that. As the consumer, will you will you buy uh, paying a little bit higher premium on that? And the response was yes. Uh, the consumer said yes, we we can buy. And we were not aware that you know there are there are palm there is a palm oil. I mean, at that time we we, we were uh, questioning around palm, and uh, and the consumers were not aware what is sustainable palm and what is palm, and and they were they were not. Uh, uh, clear about it, and and when we asked, okay, if given a choice that you have to pay one pesa more on a pack of uh, this particular product, will you will you pay it? And they said, yeah, we don't mind uh, paying this one. And that's where I believe that you know retailers can can uh, can take the lead uh, uh, or can take the charge of uh, driving this uh, change. Actually, I have not seen, I have not come across. You know, generally what we say, uh, what we see in it, uh, what we see across in India, because having lived outside with that, we have organic stores are separate. We have sustainable stores are separate. Why can't we have a separate aisle being created uh, in in the normal stores itself only, which say, okay, this is all the green options or all the sustainable options available for the product, and that's the only difference with that. I'm sure that you can you can move the traffic uh, uh, towards uh, that sustainable aisle if you do the right communication, if you do the right uh, version with it. I'm not saying that uh, affordability is 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 going to be out of out of uh, this one. Affordability is going to remain. One of the important criteria for Indian consumers, but still, I believe that how much we are talking about, we are not talking about a step change, that we are not talking about double the price actually per se. And with with scale, actually, if more and more retailers are deciding to jump into sustainable sourcing, sustainable raw material, I mean, maybe the current prices, current commercial provision looks prohibitive, but maybe with with a scale, actually, the cost is going to come down. Technological engagement, because this is a complex uh, issue on sustainability. We are talking about digitalization. We are we are talking about technological uh, intervention to make it more sustainable. Overall, this sourcing program also that's also going to reduce a lot of non-valued cost, which which currently exist in 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 the retail business and in all the businesses. And there we need to work collaboratively and transparently, and should be able to pass it on. And that's the uh, um, and with that I believe that you know we will be able to drive uh, the change uh, in in a more sustainable and positive manner. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so I'm told that the clock was wrong. I kept seeing 15 minutes more. So unfortunately, um, I think we won't be able to um, ask questions. And also, I suppose it's lunch break. Just the one last uh, piece of information that we wanted to share. Um, is that, um, uh, I mean, for all practical purposes, I would like to show this. So this is a sustainable palm oil procurement guide for uh, conscious buyers in India. This is a responsible sourcing procurement guide, which would be, uh, which we have developed, WWF have developed with the gracious support of HSBC. Um, this would be extremely useful. This talks about the entire um, you know, various methodologies, means, how can you make it profitable and, uh, yes, yet environmentally conscious. 
uh, we would look forward to um, all of you accessing this. This is both online and offline. Uh, and we would encourage um, many of you to take over to responsible um, sourcing. Um, so thank you very much, um, Sanjeev, Aloka, and Dheeraj. Extremely grateful for your time. And um, seeing you speak so passionately and actively about responsible sourcing, I'm sure many in the room uh, have a little more faith around this process. Uh, and we will hope to have uh, many more champions such as you uh, being able to influence the uh, business sector to moving into a responsible sourcing. Um, thank you.